All right, welcome everyone. Good morning. Uh, today is my great pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Wen Yishia, uh, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Civil, Construction and Environmental Engineering at North Dakota State University. So I know Wenji very well uh, because we share an office for, I think, about four years. Uh, we were sitting back to back. And uh, so he obtained his PhD uh, from Northwestern University uh, in 2016. And before he actually joined the faculty in North Dakota State University in 2018, he was a postdoctoral fellow at NIST. And a very interesting, which I'm sure you guys, many of you are, are uh, interested in the initiative, part of the Materials Genome Initiative. So it's this idea of trying to use computation, modeling experiments, everything to, to try to accelerate the pace of discovery of, of materials. So his, when his expertise is in uh, multi-scale modeling. So he uses computer simulations to try to understand and eventually design better new materials. Uh, he has published over 50 peer review papers, very good journals, uh, science advances, advanced functional materials, ACS Nano, nanoletter macromolecules. Um, he, he is an expert in, in polymeric systems in particular, but, but other systems in general. He has been funded by NSF, ONR, NASA, etc. So he's very successful. And, and you know, he already has honors and awards. Uh, recently, I believe he got the Early Career Faculty Award uh, at the, his institution. He uh, got the NICE MML accolade for technical excellence in 2019. And he got the, the CHIMAD. CHIMAD is a, a program for hierarchical materials at Northwestern, uh, and I believe NIS, a collaboration there. Uh, he got a fellowship, uh, et cetera. So he's a very accomplished researcher. We are very happy to have you here, uh, Dr. Shia. And with that, I'll, you know, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Luis, uh, for the nice introduction. So uh, I'm Wen Jixia. So uh, nice to be here and nice to uh, give the you know, department seminar. Uh, in your institution, even though this is a virtual. So today, uh, the topic I'm going to uh, present is called multi-skill modeling of macrostructure and interface in the polymeric materials. So, uh, you know, just let you know, if you have any question, you can, you know, feel free to uh, send the question in the message, chat message, or even raise your hand. I'll be, you know, try, try my best to answer your question. So uh, first of all, I want to, you know, briefly mention the, the goal of my research and the, you know, uh, so basically, you know, there are two things I'm, you know, particularly looking at. One thing is related to the thin film uh, coating. So, for example, if you are dealing with a material that is uh, has a very small dimension in one uh, thickness dimension, and but is uh, larger in the other lateral dimension, then it becomes coating and the thin film where the interface and the free surface plays a big role. So another thing we are looking at is trying to develop a lightweight, you know, high performance nano composite materials. Uh, by manipulating the macrostructure and the network. So for example, for example, we can deal with different nanoparticle and nanofiber and even putting additives and trying to improve the performance of the nanocomposites. So essentially we want to establish theoretical and the computation tool to understand the physical property of complex materials in structural and biomedical and energy sustainability fields at multiple time and land scale. So, uh, so here is the research vision. Basically, if we can come up with a predictive multi-scale modeling tool, then you know, combining the macrostructure and the interface, then we can improve the performance of materials and try to achieve multifunctionality of different complex materials. So uh, in today's uh, presentation, so first I'm going to introduce the multi-scale modeling technique, especially the predictive coarse grain molecular dynamic simulation. So you probably already know this if you took you know, Dr. Lewis' class. So uh, the next topic is trying to uh, introduce the thin film confinement and trying to compare different polymeric thin film system, which are commonly applied in industry and uh, um, academia. So the third one, I'm going to uh, talk about the nacre inspired nanocomposite. Basically, if you change the macrostructure and uh, you know, put the layer by layer assembly, how that can improve the failure mechanism Pay, uh, toughness and the stiffness. So uh, then I'm going to uh, talk about you know, a renewable resource based upon the cellulose and nanocomposite and network and look at the interface and nanoconfinement and the glass transition. So finally, I'm going to draw some key points and give the outlook. So this is the layout of today's uh, seminar. 
So uh, the first thing is the uh, nano-confined and interface. So what is a nano-confined? This one is particularly related to the microstructure. So basically, there's a lot of interesting physical phenomena happens when you reduce the dimension to be nanoscopic. So uh, for example, here, this is the one typical example, polymer thin film. So when you have a thickness that lies in uh, the range of you know, several tens or even hundreds nanometer order, then the free surface will play a dominant role. So when you compile, uh, comp you know, uh, combine different layer system together and you can form the interface. So uh, through the contact, uh, through chemical interaction, for example, covalent uh, or electrostatic or van der Waals. So here's the example on the bottom figure, you see a bilayer structure. So because of the interface, uh, you actually can um, see a lot of interesting uh, phenomena. So uh, if we understand those two features, right, the macrostructure, confinement, and also the interface, you know, which is related to the chemistry or chemical interaction, then uh, perhaps we can come up with a stronger, tougher, lighter, cheaper, and multifunctional material for the, uh, the you know, the uh, advanced the civil engineer or structural application. So however, how to combine different components or phases together and integrate them in an effective way, that is actually quite challenging. And even from the design perspective. So that's why we want to use the modeling tool to achieve a, a, you know, a better design and trying to improve the performance of the materials. So, um, you know, uh, Dr. Luis already mentioned the material genome initiative, actually my previous work and even ongoing work is actually related to the material genome initiative. And this initiative, MGI, was launched in 2011. And the, the, the idea of this material genome initiative is trying to integrate computation modeling, theory, informatics, analysis, combining with experiments, and trying to um, you know, make the next generation product two times faster and two times cheaper. So that is the goal. And my previous work, actually, you know, I was staying at NIST uh, you know, under the center for hierarchical material design, and the goal is trying to develop MGI tools, you know, modeling tools, and trying to achieve this, this uh, big goal. And this, this actually is quite important because we want to make sure the material developments, we can shorten the time for the material development. So this is the so-called, we often call it the material by design approach. So which means you design the material at the fundamental level, like you manipulate the genome, right? You change the sequence of the protein, and or the, you know, change the genome that you can control the functionality. So the same idea applies to the materials actually. So, uh, you know, what is the current challenge in terms of multi-skill modeling of complex materials, especially composite, thin film, or, you know, uh, multi-phase material. So we actually have a pretty robust tool in the atomistic modeling. For example, uh, those two relate to uh, classic molecular dynamic simulation or even the first principle calculation such as density functional theory. And we also have a pretty robust, you know, continuum modeling tool like FEM or uh, computation of fluid mechanics, you know, tools, modeling tools. Uh, so uh, some of you probably already know this. And, uh, you know, however, in between, right, if we want to uh, resolve the multi-scale problem, then we need to develop, you know, bridge this two scale, very different scale. One is focused on a top level, nanoscale level, when it's focusing on the uh, continuum level. So we want to break the two scales. So from nano to micro. Uh, and this is actually quite challenging um, from the model development perspective, because you want to achieve both quantitative and qualitative way. So uh, in terms of modeling de development, and this is also very challenging for the polymer and the nano composite materials. Why? Because their microstructure is almost random. So it's hard to um, develop a tool to capture the right physics and the right interface and microstructure for those composite system. So uh, this brings us to the first topic, the multi-scale multi modeling technique, uh, predictive coarse screen modeling methods, you know, based upon molecular dynamics. And in my group, current group, and we currently, you know, use this approach a lot to uh, address different uh, problems and uh, tackle different challenges. So uh, before doing that, so just in case you don't have the background on the molecular dynamic simulation, this is just a quick overview. So in the MD simulation, basically you just uh, you know solve the Newton's uh, second law equation of motion through an iterative way. So you put a bunch of you know uh, particles into a system, and then you know by solving solving the uh, Newton's equation, you are able to uh, analyze the trajectory or the dynamics 
uh, movements of the particle. And from there, you can gain a lot of you know, physical and the dynamics and the mechanical information. So usually the particle particle interaction could be described by the bond stretching angle, you know, rotation, dihedral, and the electrostatic and the bender wall interaction. So once you have those interactions implemented in the system, then you are able to solve the Newton's uh, equation of motion uh, numerically, then you are able to predict the position Position, velocity, and force, energy, those type of things, you know, as a function of time. So that's how the molecular dynamics works. So, uh, however, when you deal with large scale system, and if you treat each individual atom as a one particle, that is not sufficient because you need to bridge the scale, right? So then, you know, we need to use uh, a coarse grain molecular dynamics simulation. So, um, so the basic idea is trying to uh, cluster a group atom together into a super beat. And by reducing the number of degree of freedom, you are able to enhance or increase the computation speed dramatically. By doing that, you are able to overcome the spatial temporal you know, uh, limitation in the MD simulation. So here's the one example. Actually, this is the previous work, you know, uh, uh, Dr. Luis and I, you know, when we were doing PhD, we developed a model for the graphene. So, as you know, the graphene is a two-dimensional lattice material, right? So it's, it has the hexagonal lattice geometry. So we want to develop a model, you know, coarse grain model for the graphene. So uh, actually, if you look at the, this, this figure and the, the, the green, you know, lattice uh, geometry is the atomistic graphene system. So they have the carbon atom connected into the lattice shape. So to do the coarse greening, actually, we combine, you know, four adjacent you know, uh, neighbor carbon atoms together into one super beat. By doing that, you are able to form a super you know, um, hexagonal lattice, which is marked by the blue lattice geometry. So uh, you know, using some systematic way, we call the stream energy conservation approach. We are able to conserve the geometry of the lattice. And more importantly, we are able to capture the elasticity, strength, failure strength to a good approximation compared to the experiment and also atomistic modeling. So the approach we developed is so-called stream energy uh, conservation approach, which could be applied to the crystalline, you know, other materials. So, um, and the main advantage we gain from this modeling tool is that, you know, we can increase the simulation speed, you know, uh, by roughly three orders of magnitude compared to the atomistic system. So in another word, you know, the simulation with the same size, you can finish the simulation within one hour using the core screen model. However, in contrast, you probably need, uh, you know, uh, one year to finish the atomic simulation. Of course, that it plays a big role, right? So if you want to finish your PhD thesis, you want to make sure you can get the simulation down quickly, right? So you don't want to wait for you know uh, years to uh, you know get the results, right? That's that's you know um, too long. So uh, again, this is a pretty robust, uh, and this approach works well for the crystalline materials. What about polymer? So if you uh, don't have a lot of background on the polymer, basically polymer usually is an organic system, and the, it has the chain-like you know, topology, and the, it's very flexible. So because of that, you know, when you put a bunch of chain together, they usually form this uh, random and amorphous system. So it's hard actually to develop a model to preserve the microstructure of the polymer because it's completely random and amorphous, right? And because of this amorphousness nature, so actually in the polymer, we usually observe so-called glass transition, which means if you reduce the temperature and look at the enthalpy or the volume change, you can find a kink. There's a kink here. And this kink actually marks the glass transition. So more importantly, if you look at the mechanical response, such as the storage modulus or loss modulus, when you shift the temperature right across the glass transition, their mechanical or stiffness could shift you know, by several orders of magnitude. So that's why you know, um, develop a model that can capture the glass transition, we call it TG, so which is quite important. As this TG dictates the overall thermomechanical response of the power micromaterials. So in another word, we want to develop a robust material, not only capture the amorphous nature of the system, but also capture the glass transition because it relates to the thermomechanical response of the polymer, which usually is temperature dependent. So uh, previously, actually, there's a lot of the group focusing on this field. They want to develop a coarse grain polymer model. So using different approach, 
So the most widely used approach is called inverse Boltzmann method. We call it IBM. So in this method, you have the bonded parts, including bond, angle, dihedral, those type of things. You also have the non-bonded part, usually include the van der Waal interaction and the electrostatic interaction. Sometimes they combine them, lump them together in the Leonard Jones uh, potential. So uh, the, the basic idea for this approach is that they are trying to uh, match the probability distribution of the bonded parts you know, compare the atomistic and coarse grain. They want to make sure uh, they are consistent in terms of the probability distribution. And by doing that, using this equation, you are able to derive the bonded interaction. So the same idea for the non-bond interaction is that matching the probability distribution for the bonding part in the non-bond part, you actually match the radio distribution function, which give you the packing or the, you know, ordering. So, uh, you know, near the as a function of distance away from the reference particle. So by doing that, you are able to derive both equations, both function interactions. And there's uh, several, you know, other similar coarse grain modeling approach trying to do, uh, trying to achieve the similar uh, things. And for example, the force matching, sometimes we call it multi skew coarse grain and the relative entropy method and inverse Monte Carlo method. So uh, in our previous group, actually we used single approach and developed a 2D, you know, two B type, you know, polymer library for masaculate based, you know, glass polymer. So for example, here you can see that this is the, you know, masaculate based polymer, and in this uh, library of polymers, we choose two bit per monomer. So one monomer is the one repeat unit. So uh, one bit represent coarse grain bit represent the backbone. The other one represent the set chain. So by changing the set chain bit or set group bit, we are able to account for greater chemical diversity in the polymers. So however, there are several major issues regarding the previous commonly used coarse grain model of polymers. So one thing is that there's a little focus on the mechanics or mechanical response and glass transition. So which means if you use their model and you won't be able to capture the glass transition or mechanical properties um, very well. So the second thing, you know, because they reduce the number of degree of freedom in the core screen model, say, so they usually exhibit, those model exhibits artificially fast chain dynamics. For example, if you look at the diffusion, you will find the, you know, the diffusivity of the core screen polymer is much larger than the underlying atomistic system, which is not good, right? So uh, the third thing is that those model usually lack of temperature transferability, which means even though you can calibrate the parameters and trying to match the mechanics or glass transition as one single temperature state. However, once you shift the temperature, you won't be able to capture their temperature dependent behavior. So again, this is quite important because glass system is different. Due to the amorphous nature, they usually strongly, their physical pro uh, property usually strongly depends on the temperature. So capturing the temperature transferability is quite important for the coarse grain modeling of polymers. So uh, our approach actually, um, you know, we develop an approach so-called energy renormalization approach for model coarse grain model development for polymers. So here, the goal is trying to capture the temperature dependent dynamics and thermomechanical property under coarse grain. So I will illustrate this approach using the example polystyrene, which is you know commonly used for polymer. System. So polystyrene, if you see, so here's the, you know, um, the structure, chemical structure, you have the backbone, you also have the phenol ring uh, here. So here again, we adopt two bit per monomer. So one is the A, represent the backbone, the other one represent the set group. So by doing this, then we are able to build the model like this. Okay, this is the snapshot. So the, the, um, the total interaction energy, again, you have the bonding part and non-bonding parts. So for the bonding part, we use the same approach as the IBM trying to match the probability distribution. So the key is the non-bonded part. So here, so in the non-bonded part, because it governs the non-bonded interaction or the cohesive energy. So that's why it plays a big role in their thermal mechanical properties. So in the non-bonded interaction, so instead of reproducing the the RDF, the radio distribution function. So here we only use a very simple, you know, 12, 6 Leonard Jones potential. This is the equation. So, however, to make sure we can capture the temperature dependent behavior. So here in the function, we introduce the temperature dependent parameter functional form. So epsilon and the sigma. So here's the physical meaning of epsilon, which governs the energy well in the uh, number interaction and the sigma controls the you know bit bit spacing so which is the length scale parameter 
So uh, here, basically, we add uh, two terms, alpha and beta. Alpha and beta is so-called energy renormalization function, or ER function. So if we can derive the alpha and beta, then you know, uh, we possibly can capture the temperature-dependent property. So actually understanding some of the theory, you know, uh, you know, glass theory could be very helpful. For example, you know, um, the Adam Gibbs theory of glass formation, which was proposed actually long time ago, you know, 1965. So in that theory, basically they state that the activation energy of relaxation increases with you uh, with lowering the temperature due to the drop of configurational entropy. Okay, so that makes sense. You know, uh, when you uh, reduce the, you know, the uh, temperature, and you will see a drop in the configuration and, and uh, entropy. And the same way for the uh, coarse grain model. So from the atomistic to the coarse grain, because you reduce the number of degree freedom, and you also reduce the configurational entropy on the coarse graining. So uh, they also state that the activation energy vary with temperature in a sigmoidal scaling form. So if you look at this figure and it shows the activation energy vary with temperature. You can see that you know the activation energy difference between the AA, which is the atomistic system, and the CG is the coarse grain model. Actually, the difference vary with temperature, right? So which means this implies uh, that you know implies that we cannot use a single set parameter to capture the model. So our hypothesis is that you know if we can change you know the number parameter in a systematic way and trying to recover the activation energy, then we probably can reproduce most of the temperature dependent thermal mechanical property. And then we find the actually a very reliable way and the easy way we can implement in the molecular dynamic simulation module. So basically we can calculate the uh, D by order factor, which relate to the caging dynamics at the picosecond time scale. So if we can capture, preserve the D by order factor or the picosecond MSD, mean square displacement value, then we are able to reproduce the activation energy over a wide temperature range. So then we are able to recover the temperature dependent thermomechanical performance. So here's some, you know, um, path of the model we use, we build. So for example, once we implement the um, alpha or the ER function, which follows the sigmoidal relationship, so we are able to capture the high temperature arenas regime in the polymer glass. So for example, here is the diffusivity comparing the atomistic and the coarse grain model. So they actually grew pretty well. So in the intermediate temperature regime, when you lower the temperature, the system get into the non-arenas regime. So if you look at the segmental relaxation time, you are able to see they follow the, you know, the so-called BFT uh, scaling form. So uh, again, the coarse grain and the atomistic, they agree pretty well. So if you keep cooling down and the system enter into the glassy regime, right? Becomes like a glass solid. So we test the high frequency shear modulus and the results are pretty promising and they are consistent. So if you connect the alpha, right? We, again, this is the energy ER function. If you connect the ER function as a, you know, um, over a wide temperature range, then you can see they actually follow a sigmoidal relationship, which actually consistent with the Adam Gibb theory. So you have the glassy regime, you have the non arenas you know, glass forming regime. You also have the arenas regime at a very high temperature. And the theoretically, we also test the ER, you know, um, method using so-called the generalized entropy theory. And this theory actually is a combination of lattice cluster theory and the, you know, entropy theory together. So it's a theoretical modeling. So we actually throw the same idea into this theoretical modeling framework. We are able, able to analytically get the alpha parameter or ER function. So again, even with the theoretical analytical modeling, we are able to achieve this sigmoidal variation in their cohesive interaction strengths. So which means for the coarse grain model of polymer, you need to implement the temperature dependent function, ER function, following this sigmoidal variation form. So by doing that, you are able to recover the thermomechanical response. So here are some examples. We test the difference polymer having different you know, monomer structure or chain architecture. So for example, polystyrene, you know, this is the one thing, uh, one model system I already show you, and polybutadiene, which is a strong polymer, and polycarbonate, which, which considered as a fragile polymer. So all this polymer 
if you look at the ER function, they follow the sigmoidal variation. However, the magnitudes are different. We even test the small molecule glass former, like uh, also curfano. So this is a liquid molecule. You know, they can also form a glass. So if we implement the ER approach, energy renovation approach, we are able to recover the diffusivity over a wide temperature range. So actually, this approach is pretty robust. We, you know, in my current group, we actually apply this approach for a wide range of you know, polymer taps. And so far, it works pretty well. So it capture quantitatively capture the glass transition, mechanical response, and the thermal mechanical response over a wide temperature range. So once we have the model, then we can do some application, right? So the first application, uh, so I want to um, show you is the thin film confinement, which is related to the organic coating system. So uh, in, in particular, we want to understand how the monomer structure or polymer chemistry influence the confinement behavior. So actually, this is a very challenging topic. So, um, you know, a uh, long time ago, people trying to understand this, but, you know, they couldn't uh, get a, you know, reasonable explanation through the experimental uh, test. So we want to test using our developer core screen model and trying to provide additional insights. So why we want to understand the polystyrene and the PMA? Because these two polymer, first, they both are glass forming polymer. And uh, if you look at their physical property, they have a similar uh, monomer weight or repeat unit weight. They have a similar glass transition, the density modulus and the fragility, which give you the you know, sensitivity of segmental relaxation to uh, the temperature. So if you look at those you know, major physical property, they're actually quite similar. However, when they throw that, when they do the experimental measurements, so uh, here, so here is the polystyrene and PMA, you know, a model we use. So when you put that in the experiments, and this is the glass transition, okay, data from the experimental measurements. So they look at the glass transition as a function of film thickness, and they realize that when you put those two systems in the same film confined state, and you will see a big shift, big difference between their glass transition. So at the bulk level, they are quite similar. But when you introduce the free surface or interface, you will see big difference. So this so-called confinement behavior. So we want to test whether our core screen modeling approach can reproduce the similar phenomenon. That's the first thing we want to test. So here's the result. You know, by uh, throw, you know, throwing the model into the machine computer, and we, do this, we did some tests and look at the glass transition, confinement behavior, and the red data is the PMA, and the blue one is the polystyrene thin film. So you can see that you know for the polystyrene, you can see a much larger drop when you reduce the film dimension, right, compared to the uh, PMA, which great well with the experiments. So and because you know uh, in our modeling simulation, we are able to gain additional insight. So if you if you observe the uh, monomer structure in the core screen model, so we realize that. For the polystyrene, you actually you have a smaller backbone, but a relative, you know, larger uh, or stiffer set group, which captured by the blue beef. However, for the PMA, which is uh, just opposite, you have a you know relative larger backbone but smaller set chain. And our hypothesis is that maybe if you switch the backbone and the you know set chain mass ratio, you are able to systematically twin the TG drop within the same film state. So we, we test this hypothesis and we systematically vary the backbone to the set group ratio. So here's the data. We are able to see that when you vary from the PMA situation to the polystyrene, and you are able to see a systematic TG shift change. And this actually explains why experimentally they observe so big difference in their TG confinement behavior. So the main reason is that the set chain fluctuation play a big role under the influence of the free surface. So by changing the monomer structure, you are able to control or tune the confinement behavior when you reduce the film thickness to uh, the nanoscopic level. So, uh, and the reason they will also make some tests to look at the, you know, confinement behavior for the mechanical property. So here's the film, uh, you know, the uh, modulus, elastic modulus as the glassy state, we compare different, you know, uh, uh, polymer system, you know, polystyrene, PMA, and the PEC PMA is another macellar polymer. So uh, we also compare with the experimental data and we 
wrap a universal model based upon the so-called layered composite model and trying to predict the uh, sickness dependent models. And our model actually work, you know, agree with the experiment pretty well. And the developed composite model can theoretically explain why the sur free surface or the interface, uh, how those interface in, uh, influence the models or stiffness of the polymer. So this is the polymer. And uh, I already show you the core screen of graphene, right? So let's put the graphene and the polymer together and forming the composite. That is the next topic I'm going to introduce. So the, the motivation behind this actually is uh, from the, you know, our previous collaborator, you know, Dr. Espinosa at Northwestern. The, in their group, actually, uh, they stack multiple graphene sheets together uh, to form the so-called multi-layer graphene. So, and they did some uh, indentation, AFM indentation, um, measurement, experimental measurement. And what they observed is that, you know, for if you indent the single sheet, so there's no hysteresis from the loading and the unloading curve. However, when you stack multiple sheets together, forming the multi-layer graphene, there's a hysteresis behavior happening. So if you look at this curve, the lo loading and unloading, they are not overlap, right? This means there's some energy dissipation and they don't know why. So they let us, you know, uh, using our course and develop a course with model of graphene and trying to uh, see how it goes in the simulation. So again, we just mimic the experiment. We put, you know, a multiple graphene system together forming the multi-layer graphene. And we did the simulation indentation so indentation simulation, and we observe similar behavior. You can see there's the hysteresis behavior, which marks the energy dissipation. So if we take a closer look at the simulation system, we observe that when you uh, indent the system, right? So when the deformation becomes large enough, actually the deformation can initiate interlayer slippage. So because of the relative slippage between the graphene layer, you can generate actually uh, energy right through the uh, dissipation slippage. So this actually uh, provides us some idea how to better utilize, you know, a multi-layer graphene as the, you know, uh, energy absorption system. So if we combine the multi-layer graphene with the polymer system, then we can form this so-called nacre inspired layer by layer assembly composite system. So the graphene is a strong, stiff, and polymer is tough and, and light. So if we combine both together, we can form this so-called nacre inspired composite system. So that is the next topic. We want to understand the mechanics and also the failure mechanism of this special composite system. So actually this composite system has been you know, synthesized experimentally. So they use the layer by layer you know, uh, spin coating and uh, spin casting and to form this layer structure. And they deposit, you know, polymer in between the uh, plate slate layer. So then, by doing that, you are able to form this layer by layer assembly. So this is the uh, actual course we model we develop. So again, you know, here the uh, yellow one, yellow face, is the multi-layer graphene, and in between is the poly uh, methyl mesaccharide PMA, the course we model of PMA. So uh, if you put them together, you can form this layer by layer structure. So here we only look at the RV representative uh, volume elements. So we want to uh, apply some, you know, pull out tests and try to study the interface and the failure mechanism of this system. So here, this is the, you know, video uh, showing the stretching of this, this layer by layer um, test, the pooling, tensile, you know, pooling. And you can see as we deform, this multi-layer system, you are able to see, uh, you know, graphing um, stretching and the yielding slippage. So you are able to see the macro pore formation, and then you are able to see uh, the pullout of the graphene and also polymer chain. So in the end, they can form this nanofibril, which actually is the, you know, related to the creasing behavior. So, um, so let me play one more time. So when you stretch, you do a tensile deformation. You can see the graphene yielding and the graphene sleeping. And you can see the macropore, you know, formation. And finally, they can form this, you know, uh, nanofibril. You can see the creasing of the polymer layer as well. 
So actually it's quite interesting, but it's very complicated to study actually. So, um, you know, the easy way to uh, analyze the data, first, we just look at the steepening effect by looking at the models of the system. So what we observe is that, you know, actually the, because of the, if you reduce the dimension of the polymer layer into nanoscopy, you can see a big increase in their stiffness. So as you increase the interfacial interaction strength between the polymer and the graphene system, let's say if you do some functionalization of the graphene, such as using the graphene oxide, you are able to enhance the, the uh, stiffness of polymer phase a lot. So by reducing the thickness, you are ab also able to see an increase in the, um, in the thin film system, basically nanoconfinement and stronger interaction and bending lead to interfacial stiffening due to the interface formation. And polymer with a smaller thickness actually can exhibit the greater confinement. So this agree pretty well with the experiments. So experimentally, if you look at the tensile strength and also elastic models, if you reduce the polymer thickness, generally you can see an increase in the uh, value, in their property value. So, and this increase actually deviates or go beyond the rule of mixture in the composite model, which means you gain additional deepening effect by reducing the film thickness due to the confinement, so-called with so-called interfacial stiffening effect. So then we also perform this you know, pull out um, simulation and trying to look at the uh, failure mechanism. So here we actually observe two failure mechanisms. One is the graphing yield. The other one is the interfacial failure. And by changing the number of layer in the graphene phase, you actually can change the uh, failure mode. So from the multi-layer graphene yielding to the multi-layer graphene pullout. And more importantly, we observe that for the multi-layer yielding, you actually gain additional toughness compared to the pullout mode. Why? Because the slippage between the graphene layer actually can generate a lot of energy. So during the deformation. So that's why you gain a much larger toughness. So uh, this is the, you know, the layer by layer composite system. So uh, however, one issue with the graphene is that when you do the functionalization, trying to improve the interfacial interaction between the polymer and graphene, you also observe this huge you know, heterogeneity and also defect. This will weaken the performance of the composites. So can we take a look at some other alternative system, especially from the renewable resource? So that actually brings me to the next topic, the cellulose nanocomposite and network and trying to understand the interface and confinement in this particular system. So why non cellulose is the better option? So uh, actually cellulose can be extracted from the wood or you know, some marine system. Um, so here's the hierarchical you know, structure of the wood, right? So if you look at the fundamental building block that can sustain the loads for the wood actually, it's because of the cellulose chain. So here's the cellulose chain. And more importantly, if you stack the cellulose chain into the fibro structure, they can form the nanocrystal or nanofibro-like uh, uh, macrostructure. And because of those macrostructure and hydrogen bonding, they actually can sustain a lot of loads. So that's why the wood is often used in the civil engineering uh, construction and material. So if you look at the uh, modulus and the uh, strength compared to other you know, um, structural materials, actually the cellulose is pretty high. They have the modulus, 10 cell modulus uh, in the order of you know, 110 to uh, 200 gigapascal, which is comparable to the structural steel actually. So more importantly, and this uh, non cellulose, you can functionalize their surface because of the hydroxyl group exposed on the surface. So it can form the hydrogen bonding and you can do some surface chemistry modification and changing the surface chemistry and you are able to enhance or tune the compatibility between the cellulose and other matrix material. So that's why we want to use the nanocellulose for the composite and structural material application. So here we want to come up with some material by design uh, uh, framework using the based upon the multi-skill modeling for the nanocellulose uh, based composite system. So in particular, we focus on the design of the interface and we, we try to uh, optimize the uh, thermomechanical performance using the nanocellulose. So uh, first of all, we perform the atomistic simulation. We understand, trying to understand the interfacial characteristic, you know, uh, amorphous and versus crystalline interface. So if you look at the cellulose layer, right, it could be either in the crystalline 
phase, which means it's a well-ordered, you know, cellulose chain packed together and forming this uh, cellulose nanocrystal CNC, or you can form this amorphous cellulose, which just like a polymer glass. So if we put both phase, you know, both phase would exist in the natural system. So we want to look at how they impact the interaction with the polymer matrix. So actually what we realized is that, you know, when you are, uh, you know, changing the interface, you know, characteristic or structure, you're able to change the adhesion energy between the cells and the polymer. And this actually also agree well with the experiment. So in the experiment, they actually modify the surface chemistry and they see, they observe the um, different interfacial energy and also dispersion factor. So this suggests us by doing some microstructure change or chemistry modification, we're able to tune the compatibility between the cells and polymer matrix. That's a good thing. We can change the interaction and the adhesion energy. So uh, for the three-dimensional nanocomposite system, we also want to look at the gas transition because the gas transition dictates the overall thermomechanical response. So uh, actually this is quite challenging, even using the uh, core screen model we developed for this particular system, three-dimensional nanocomposite system. So we want to find a better uh, way or more computationally efficient way uh, to overcome this uh, issue and try to uh, you know, calculate the gas transition. So actually the good thing for us is that we you know, dig into the previous literature. So in the 2025, uh, 2005 and 2007, there are two papers, relevant papers published in the major materials. They actually shows that you know, for the thin film, if you look at the TG reduction as a function of the thickness, it's actually consistent with the composite system as you reduce the particle particle spacing. So they basically establish a thin film and the composite analogy through the rigorous experimental path. So then this give us some idea. So we probably can use a layered system like a thin film to predict the three dimensional composite material properties. So that is how we did. We actually build a multi scale modeling framework so we start with the surface calculation, look at the adhesion energy, you can do the uh, macrostructure change, uh, or you can do some surface functionalization. For example, you can add some uh, additional group like temple oxidized surface and trying to tune the interfacial adhesion energy between the polymer and the cellulose. Then we use the core screen model and uh, simulate a thin film or layer structure and look at the glass transition. Then we map up to the three-dimensional composite model by using the uh, thin film composite analogy. So this is the result we get. So here, this is the TG we calculate through the uh, multi-scale modeling framework. And here's the film thickness or the weight percentage uh, of the uh, loading, not the particle loading. And what we observe is that, you know, as you reduce the particle-particle uh, spacing or the thin film thickness, you are able to see a TG enhancement for most of the cases. However, if there's a weak interaction between the cells and the part matrix, you will see a, a TG drop. So more importantly, our prediction actually also showed there exists an upper bound and lower bound for the TG. So this actually give us some design space, you know, limitation, right? So uh, no matter how you modify the surface of the polymer, or the cellulose, sorry, the cellulose, you won't be able to go beyond the upper and the lower bounds. So the only way to go beyond the upper and the lower bound is to replace the host polymer matrix. That's the only way. So this can, this can be uh, observed actually from our simulation. So uh, more recently, we actually, you know, uh, graph the polymer on the uh, nanocrystal particles and forming this so-called hair nanoparticle. So if we, uh, assemble those hairy nanoparticle, then this becomes assembled hair nanoparticle, which can form another type of composite. So why we are doing this? Because one of the issue for the nanocomposite is that because of the nanoparticle dimension is so small and their interaction with the matrix so large and usually they can aggregate. So they can aggregate because the particle particle interaction could also be very large. So usually they can aggregate and uh, they have some dispersion issue. So by grafting the polymer on the particle surface, you are able to overcome this dispersion challenge, which means you can form a uniform distributed uh, particle within the composite. So we want to uh, you know, design this type of system using the developed multi-scale modeling tools 
So here, actually, this is the simulation result we get. So by using the machine learning, we use the Gaussian process machine learning algorithm. Then we are able to test how different design parameters, including graphing density, chain length, nonparticle particle size, nonparticle particle interaction, and weight percentage of the particles, right? A lot of design parameters. So using machine learning and the multi-skill modeling, we are able to, uh, you know, uh, decipher or decode the structure property relationship. So here, for example, this is the Young's modulus versus toughness. We are able to obtain this so-called Pareto frontier by throwing our data, simulation data, and using machine learning algorithm trying to make a predictive model for the Young's modulus and toughness. And uh, more importantly, from the uh, multi-skill modeling, we are able to observe the key mechanism that dominates their stiffness or toughness. So by changing those design parameters, for example, if the polymer chain conformation lie in the semi-dilute polymer brush regime, and they can provide more toughness compared to the concentrated polymer brush regime. And also we observe that at least you know, 60 percent of CNC by weight is required to reach the fr Pareto frontier, which marks the optimum design of this particular composite system. So that's quite unique and novel from the modeling perspective. So more recently, we also look into the nanocellulose network, network, which means we get rid of the polymer matrix. Without any polymer matrix, we only put the CNC or the cellulose nanofiber together, forming this simple system. We usually call it nanopaper. And we throw into the simulation, we throw our simulation into the machine and trying to look at the, uh, the, how the microstructure influences the mechanical response. So here basically shows how the shear modulus scale with the packing density. By changing the packing density, you are able to change the shear modulus and they follow the power law scaling relationship. So, and from the simulation, we also actually uh, take a closer look at the dynamics part under deformation. So here this shows, you know, if you do the tensile stretching, how the particle dynamics change. So they actually shows uh, uh, you know, great dynamic and mechanical heterogeneity. So because of their macro complex macrostructure and poor uh, voids formed under the deformation. So actually, if you have a higher density and the lower stream or the stronger CNC interaction, you will see a larger dynamic and mechanical heterogeneity for this particular system, which is quite interesting for us. So uh, looking to the future, so if we can control or if we understand the different you know, design parameter and how those parameters influence the property, so we probably can uh, you know, gain uh, additional insight and try to better design more compact system. So uh, here's a several you know, ongoing work we, kept, we are currently you know, working on. So one thing we are looking at the crumple matter. For example, this is actually quite interesting. If we have a thin sheet, we uh, just compress the thin sheet and form the crumple system and how the macrostructure look like and how that macrostructure influence the structural or mechanical conformation property. So we want to gain a better understanding on that. So we use our you know, graphing, graphing model. And for this purpose, we throw a bunch of graphing sheets together forming this so-called bulk graphing. Or if we look at the single graphing, we crumple them into a, you know, a, a crumpled matter. Then we are able to look at how the energy and the morphology change as you uh, compress the system. So very interesting for this you know, graphing melt system or a graphing bulk graphing system, if you throw a bunch of you know, layer structure sheet together forming this bulk system, we also observe a glass transition, which is quite similar to the polymer glass. So for this study, we actually establish uh, you know, the uh, sheet and the polymer uh, analogy from the, our simulation results. So if you form this, even though if you look at individual graphene sheets, it's actually a crystalline, a, crisp, a crystalline material. However, if you put a bunch of graphene together forming this amorphous system, you actually see a glass forming behavior for this system. So it's similar to the polymer glass. And more recently, we're using the energy renovation approach and we're trying to uh, develop a model for the semiconducting conjugated polymer. And this polymer is quite unique because it's semiconducting, which means it has a relatively smaller band gap compared to other regular polymer, which is almost a non-conductive. So uh, here's some you know, uh, DFT simulation result and showing the uh, molecular orbital 
and the way through our molecular simulation and multi scale model into the computer and look at the you know conformation change as you vary the set chain length. So this is a current ongoing work. So we also perform some mechanical tests for this system and trying to understand how uh, the morphology and the chain architecture influence this their deformation behavior. And eventually, we also develop some model to predict the gas transition of this semiconductive polymer. This is quite important for the practical application, especially in the flexible electronic system. So uh, this is another ongoing work. So we actually uh, using the energy renormalization approach, you know, which is quite similar to uh, the graphene system. We are currently develop a coarse grain model for the nano clay. So, and we also develop a model for the clay polymer nano composites. So this is also quite interesting. This is the ongoing work we are still working on uh, develop a model development for this particular system, you know, the nano clay or the clay sheet. So these are the several uh, ongoing work. So finally, I want to give some take home message. So the multi skew modeling in conjunction with the uh, experiment and machine learning actually can help us uh, ex interpret you know, uh, complex phenomena and the experimental observation, make prediction of their size effect and make better design of materials. So the nano-confined and interface combined could serve as the you know, stiffness, toughness, PG enhancement mechanism. And finally, so bio-inspired and renewable materials such as cellulose could offer new opportunity for achieving high performance functional structural materials. So uh, with that, I would like to uh, thank my uh, collaborator and also the funding agents. And the, most of the work actually are supported by the NIST and the CHIMED and the NASA and the DOD uh, ARO, Army Research uh, uh, Office, and also the NSF. So uh, I would also like to uh, acknowledge the NDSU Foundation and also support from NDSU. Thank you. So if you have any question, you know, feel free to ask.